All right, we're on with Quinn from uh, the Garden of Eden. Uh, I'll let you tell the story of, of what happened here. Well, really, it it, uh, it all it all starts back in February. Uh, you know, we've been we've been living sustainably here for quite a few years now, and really, there's not too much difference about what we're doing right now from what we were doing, say, last year or the year before that, except for that we're more public about it. Um, we're on the very outskirts of Arlington, so they didn't really know we were here. Um, but in February, they sent us, you know, some code violation, you know, citation, you know, pieces of paper. And, uh, you know, amongst the violations, there's a bunch of ridiculous stuff, you know, like improperly stacked wood and... You know, cars not parked on, you know, paved, you know, slabs and, uh, you know, grasses that were too tall and, you know, all sorts of ridiculous stuff. And then there was one thing on there, which was that uh, the bushes on the on the roadside of our land were growing over into the road. Um, so we immediately cut those because we base, we base of our, our whole existence on the golden rule, uh, God's law, natural law, uh, common law. Mm -hmm. uh, constitutional law, which is that if you don't hurt somebody, if you're not impeding someone else's way of life, then you're not doing any wrong. There is no problem. And so we figured, well, you know, that's worth doing because, you know, if it's knocking people's cars or whatever, you know, it may interfere with their free will right to travel. You know, of course, now people that are driving aren't free because they're operating, you know, under motor vehicle laws and blah, blah, blah. So they're not free anyways. But we don't want to impede on anybody, so we're happy to do that. So we cut them down, uh, you know, trimmed them all off the road, and then uh, we sent them a lawful notification. And we said, you know, look, uh, we live a sustainable life. We live an honorable life. Everything that we're doing is an integral part of our way of life. You know, our number one priority isn't beauty. Our number one priority isn't conformity. It's not in doing in the way that everyone else in the suburb does it because uh, we're growing our own food. You know, we're living a sustainable life, and there's all sorts of things that we need to do that facilitate that, you know, compost piles and, you know, things like that. And so we said, anyways, it's our, as far as we know, it's our right to be secure um, on our land, be secure in our person and our property and our effects. Um, you know, it's our right to be on our spiritual path to pursue happiness. And unless we're hurting somebody, unless you have a corpus delicti, an affidavit of damages, um, then you don't have any authority or jurisdiction to enforce these codes and statutes because no code or statute can supersede a superior law. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we sent them, you know, registered mail, uh, you know, signs warning and attested to under penalty of perjury, and we said, look, um, if you know of a law that says we can't do this, that applies to us, and if you know of a law that gives you authority to enforce your will against us without our consent and without a damaged party, then show it to us, and we'd be happy to, you know, have, do, you know, a due process of law communication. Um, they never responded. Uh, so we sent them another lawful notification, and we said, look, um, you know, we asked you to show this, 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 and this. You did it. So, for the record, this, 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 and this is true. Um, if at any point in time you have, you know, proof, you have bona fide facts under penalty of perjury that this is not true, you're welcome to communicate that with us. But until then, this is established as truth. And this is, this is how law works. This is mm -hmm. how due process of law works. We know how the law works, and we're doing it honorably. And uh, they still didn't, you know, respond to anything. So they agreed. Their silence is their acquiescence. It was part of the contractual agreement. We sent it certified mail. We have a signature that they received it. Um, we sent it to the city mayor, we sent it to the city manager, we sent it to the code compliance office, multiple individuals there. Not only did we send it to individuals who signed to receive it, so we know that we got it, but we also put notice to one as notice to all. So we noticed the whole Arlington department of our status as free beings. Um, so we've already made that clear on the record. Um, anyways, they continued to send us citations, um, of which we of course did not pay, and we continued to send them lawful notifications, which said, we've already established this, we've already established this. Um, they started to threaten us. They started to threaten us by forcefully coming upon our land, trespassing by force, um, to steal our, our possessions, which we have, we have inalienable rights to be secure, but the Constitution, the supreme law of this land, 
is designed to protect and uphold those inalienable rights. Yeah. Um, so they started making these threats to us, and we, uh, you know, we put a, a lock, a, a big chain, and a lock on the gate about six months ago. Um, we contacted the sheriff of Tarrant County, and we sent him, a, you know, a certified mail with, you know, signed, sworn, and attested to under a penalty of perjury. Um, that our life was in danger, our family was in danger, our well-being, our livelihood was all being threatened and in danger, and we needed this elected official um, to honor his oath of office, which is to, at a minimum, investigate our claims. We sent him a stack of documents which proved our lawful correspondences, which proved their threats, um, which proved all sorts of things. Um, he never responded to us. We've got all of these documents. We've got them all. Uh... So, you know, we've basically been on lockdown here for six months. Uh, you know, we can't do our workshops, we can't do our retreats, you know, we, uh, the, the patrons can't come and, you know, can't trade for our food or pr trade for our artisan crafts. Um, they, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to um, s citation us and fine us and for, um, you know, for selling food, for, um, you know, selling unlicensed retail. Uh, you know, they're trying everything that they possibly can to try to, try to destroy our livelihood. Um, you know, but uh, we're not operating as a business. Right. You know, we're not a business. And we don't have to follow business law. We're operating as free men and women. And it is our right to, you know, secure our own livelihood. And that's what we're doing. And everything we're doing is all based in law. You know, we're not belligerent. We're not, you know, arrogant, you know, self-righteous, you know you're going to burn in the fires of hell if you don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're not going door to door telling people, like, you should live like us. Like, we're just living a really badass life. Mm -hmm. You know, we're super <laughs> healthy. You know, I've only been sick one day in 13 years. Um, we've got way more than enough food, highest quality food you can't buy. Uh, you know, we don't ever wake up at alarm clock. We can go to sleep and sleep as long as we want every day. We don't ever have to sit in traffic. We don't have to ever listen to a boss. We don't ever have to pretend. We don't have to put on a suit or any uniform. We don't have to be appropriate in the workplace. Uh, we don't have to pay all of our, our money in taxation. Um, you know, we don't have to follow all the rules. We get to do whatever we want. And it's a beautiful life. Uh, so, you know, they've, they've tried their hardest to shut us down. And, and the real the real truth of why they've, they've cracked down so hard is not because, you know, We've got some tall grass, you know, obviously. Not because we've got some, you know, tires or, you know, stacks of wood out in the land. It's because we know the truth and because we're sharing the truth with the people. We know how to be self-sufficient and independent, which is terrifying for the system because it only thrives on dependency of the people. Um, also, we know how the law works. And the law is a way that people can enforce their freedom. And the real truth is, is that if you need to be given freedom, you're not free and you don't deserve freedom. You have to enforce you have to defend your freedom at all times, at all moments. And if you don't do that, you're not free and you don't deserve to be free. So we know how to do that. We're equipping and empowering the people how to do that. Um, so that's what they really don't like. Uh, we've challenged all of their jurisdiction, all of their power um, in many different ways on the record. So we've got a huge book, you know, stacks of documents like this with all of our on-the-record correspondences. We'll, I mean, we'll show it to anyone that wants to see the truth. All the media is that I mean, media has been coming here for days doing interviews and what and we've showed them all the documents and not one of them showed any of the documents on their newscast. But they showed the they showed the Arlington police documents. <laughs> you know, it's not fair. It's not fair in any way, and it just shows you that uh, you know they're in bed with the same system. They're in bed yeah. with each other, um, and uh, it, it's not fair in any way. So. Thankfully, we're not ignorant, you know, fearful, disempowered slaves. Thankfully, we're educated, empowered, intelligent people, and we are equipped and also ready to stand for the truth. So, anyways, it, it's been, you know, it's been escalating over a period of time. We actually know for a fact that they've been secretly putting a case together on us since March, uh, at a minimum. Um, they've sent undercover uh, agents to our land. Um, they've had surveillance of helicopters and unmanned drones. Uh, you know, police cars have driven by plenty of times. Uh, you know, even, you know, sat out on the side of the road, you know, plenty of times. Um, and who knows? Who knows what else? You know, tapping the phones, you know, emails, like, you know, 
we obviously know now that NSA can do that whenever they want to anyways. Right. Um, so, you know, whether they admit to it or not on the record, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, so they've been putting this, you know, case together for a long time. They've been looking for a way to try to destroy us, but at the same time, they were trying to, you know, being careful because, you know, we're being careful. You know, we're not, like I said, we're not belligerent. You know, we're not, like, giving them an excuse. Uh, and then, you know, I don't know, somehow, somehow they got, you know, some word from someone who doesn't like us, you know, or something maybe that we were, you know, growing marijuana, you know, that we were drug trafficking. I don't know. I don't know where they got this intel. It's obviously horrible <laughs> intel. I have two of my own theories on that. I'd love to bounce off of you. Okay. What? One, depends on whether your okra was the kind that grows a great big leaf that looks like a fig leaf or a funny little five-fingered leaf. Because around 1970, I was a kid, but I was old enough to remember it. Like I said, I grew up in this neighborhood. Up on Sublet Road, they pulled up a farmer's patch of oh, okra. We do have okra. Uh -huh. Well, I saw in the paper, that, or one of the news articles, that they pulled up your okra. I was going, this isn't the first time the police have pulled up okra in this, mm -hmm. this neighborhood. Well, because we do of, have okra, and you know, maybe that could be it, but, you know... That's, I mean, it's still their mistake. Like, you yeah. know, if they're going to spend $100,000, you know, they should be right. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, for them, they just get to use it and waste it because it's just taxpayer money. But who are the people that are slaving away every single day, you know, to make those payments? It's, it's the people. That's who's doing it. Uh, and there's just no way there's ever responsibility, you know, without accountability. And it's like, it's like a rich kid's, you know, a rich kid, you know. I grew up in a, you know, somewhat of a privileged area, and, you know, I never got bought a single car or vehicle or of any kind, never got bought anything, but, um, you know, I knew kids that would get, like, Porsches and Hummers, you know, at 16 years old, and, you know, they'd wreck them in, like, six months, Yeah. and then they'd get, you know, something else, um, and it's just without that, you know, without that, without making it yourself, without, you know, doing the work, it's really hard to, you know, really use it wisely. And so, you know, we've just gotten into this horrible system with mandatory taxes where, you know, they've just got this huge pool of money to, you know, tap into at women will. And, you know, it just gets, you know, used and it's only used to try to, you know, create more power. So anyways, um, you know, they, they, you know, they've been really, um, you know, pretty uh, upset with us for, for a while now and just been, you know, been itching, itching you know, fucking put their boots and guns on our land. And I guess this, you know, gave them the fuel, you know, to try to justify that. And so they, they rushed it and they made a mistake. You know, they sent a helicopter. They sent, a, you know, an unmanned drone over. And supposedly it was some really experienced, you know, marijuana, you know, plant guy. Um, but obviously he made a mistake. You know, a heavyweight champion can't afford mistakes. You, right. you make a mistake, you're not a heavyweight champion anymore. And really, a government official should have even more responsibility and accountability than a heavyweight champion, because our, we the people, our lives are at stake. And that's why, um, back in the day, we so purposefully heavily regulated those public servants. Uh, we gave them limited delegated authority, which means they had authority under very limited specific situations. And unless it was under one of those limited specific, specific uh, situations based on their capacity, their official capacity, they had nothing. Uh, and they're, they're totally bound by that. So the oath of office is really important. You know, it's the, it's the essential foundation for our, for our whole government system. Yes. And it really is that simple. And it's also as simple now as it's just being completely violated. It's looked on as a formality, just a ceremony. Yeah, and which is ridiculous because it still has it still has power and basis in law. And I would, I would also point out on those search warrants, they were filed, uh, you know, taken under oath or affidavit, or you know, oath or assertion, as the Constitution says. Yeah, yeah, they're liable to have perjured themselves on those right. If search you, right, if you make, if you well, if yeah, if you make an affidavit, it has to be under oath. Mm -hmm. And there was an affidavit, and it was under oath. And actually, if you look at that affidavit, it's a really great thing to look at. It's basically all conjecture. And if you know, it's what an almost smart. It, well, say it looked like marijuana plants. That's not a lie. If you say I saw marijuana plants, right, you, that's but, a lie. Right, but here's the problem: is that an affidavit? Do you know what an affidavit is? It's a statement of facts. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you can't, there cannot be conjecture. There can be no conjecture in an affidavit. That's a good point. <laughs> so it's already void ab initio. Uh, it's already an improper affidavit, and a judge should know that. See, that's why there has to be an affidavit, but there also has to be a judge's signature and seal. See, there's, all, there's many steps that must take place perfectly before it's, a, it's a, du, a, a qualified due process of law operation. And they haven't crossed any of their T's, marked any of their I's. Every single thing they've done the entire way has been a mistake. It's been a violation of due process of law. Every single thing. And we have the documented proof of that. Um, you know, I don't hate these people. I don't wish them any harm. I'm not anti-government. Uh, I love the government. I love our country. I love the system that was designed to preserve and protect all of our freedoms. Uh, what I'm anti is anti-rule, anti-dictatorship, anti-tyranny, anti-mandatory taxation, you know, anti, anti-loss anti of liberty. That's what I'm anti. Mm -hmm. And so what I want is I want justice and, you know, we don't have to have a war here. Let's just, uh, you know, go to court. You know, let's scrutinize under under law, you know, the real truth, and let's, you know, show the real truth. And let's make that an example for everybody. Uh, because everybody should be held accountable to law, and everybody should be afforded due process of law, whether you're a criminal or whether you're a government official. Due process of law is an essential part of a, of a free society. Mm -hmm. Due process of law has to be there, so you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, so, you know, their affidavit, you know, is all based on conjecture, which, you know, you can't do. The judge should have known that. So, you know, the judge, we've got a problem with the judge. We've got a problem with the Detective Perez, you know, that did this affidavit. Um, you know, we've got a problem with whoever, you know, De Detective Perez's superior was. Um, we've got a problem with all the code compliance officers because we, you know, sent them lawful notifications. we got a problem with the city mayor, the sheriff, the uh, city manager. We got a problem with all of them, according to, you know, violations of due process of law and our rights on record. Uh, you know, we're not, we don't want to make any claims that aren't true. And if anything that we're saying can be proven untrue, then we're happy to listen to that and, and to hear that. We don't want anything that's not right, that's not just. But so far, see, here's the thing, is that every single time we've followed due process of law and communicated with them the truth, all they've done is just try to ignore us and continue to enforce and threat. Force and threat, force and threat. So, finally, uh, on the 30th of this month, which is coincidentally uh, the same time that this alleged Detective Perez said that uh, Quinn Aker was in possession of under two ounces of marijuana, which is impossible because, you know, I was here on this land the day before that, the day before that, and the day after that, and the day after that, because we don't leave, I don't leave. Uh, there was no, you know, we didn't let any... And let any detectives on our land. Uh, we didn't have any events. Uh, there's no way that uh, a police officer could have, or a detective undercover, no one could have could have proven that. So they, they just made that up, sort yeah. of ho hoping and assuming, well, you know, once the raid happens, we'll, we'll, you know, it'll be guaranteed that there's more than two ounces, so we can prove that there was, you know, two ounces of the 30th. But anyway, subsequently on the 30th, there was a helicopter flyover and a drone. Um, of which the city is denying that they sent a drone. But we know the city of Arlington has a drone, and we saw it. We have four witnesses that are willing to testify under penalty of perjury that they saw a drone. Um, you know, and I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, hear some people in the office under penalty of perjury say that there wasn't. Um, you know, it's easy to make a statement you know, right. on the news, but let's hear it under penalty of perjury. Um, so anyways, that happened, and then... On the 2nd of August, 7.40 a.m., uh, you know, I stuck my head out the door right over there because I heard some commotion at the front gate, and I thought that it was uh, like a big uh, wood chip truck because we have uh, wood chip companies that dump off their loads of wood chips here because they have to pay to dump them, you know, at a landfill, so we let them do it for free, and then we get to use all the wood chips for mulch and compost and all sorts of great things. Uh, so we save it from the landfill and use it as a valuable resource. So that's what I thought it was. And I stuck my head out, and I see, you know, fully battle-ready armed, you know, SWAT team. They got the bulletproof shields. They got the sidearms, the fully, you know, the the, auto, the assault rifles. You know, the you know the the taser sidearm guns, the you know helmets, the ski masks, everything. Uh, and so there's two children here, mm -hmm. and you know one of them's two 
at the time was two weeks old, and the other one's under two years old. And they, of course, were asleep up with their mother. And, you know, of course, that's my th first thought is, oh, my God, the children. You know, like, I don't care what happens to me, you know, but the children. And so, you know, I immediately went up to, you know, wake the mother and, you know, prepare her for the in in inevitability. So there's no, no, nothing we can do. Uh, you know, I told her there's a SWAT, a SWAT team here. And, uh, you know, of course, she's shaking and rattled. She's, you know, sleeping naked with the, you know, babies, you know, nursing on her breasts. Uh, so she gets up, puts some clothes on, takes some deep breaths, you know, prepares herself. And I say, look, you know, just keep calm. You know, just be calm, just be calm, just be calm. Um, anyways, they wind up, you know, getting to the upstairs last. Uh, you know, we hear them shouting, you know, you know, announce yourselves, you know, if there's anyone, you know, anywhere, you know, blah, 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 you know, come down, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, so I called down and I said, look, you know, there's, there's two children up here, you know, a mother and two children up here, you know, like, uh, I'm happy to come down, you know, there was no weapons, there's no violence, there's no problem, you know, so I walked very slowly, you know, to where, you know, with my hands above my head to where they could sort of see probably my upper body um, from, the, from the, the bottom of the stairs, and I just sort of stood there for a few moments, you know, just reaffirming with them, you know, it's all okay, you know, just doing a little, like, Jedi, you know, magic, it's all okay, just, there's women and children up here, you know, you can secure the premises, but just, you know, you know, be calm, there's no weapons, no resistance, went down slowly, you know, grabbed me, uh, two guys grabbed me, put me in handcuffs, brought me right in here, um, which is where, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five of the other um, inhabitants here at the time, were already handcuffed and seated on the ground. There was uh, two or three, you know, fully armed SWAT, SWAT guys, uh, you know, standing with guns, you know, over over those people. They brought me in. Um, as soon as I sat down and took a couple breaths, you know, I immediately asked for a warrant. I said, well, you know, where's where's a warrant to, you know, to justify what you're doing right now? Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we've done nothing that justifies this. I guarantee it. So I want to see the warrant that, that makes you think you have some sort of justification for this. They wouldn't show it to us. They said, oh, it's not here. It'll be here, you know, in a while. You get to see it later. And so that's already a problem. Yeah. Uh, warrants have to be presented on site, especially to the landowner. You would technically be justified in resisting. You'd be dead, but you'd be justified. Right, exactly. And that just shows you how many levels of problems we have. Not only would it be our right to resist, but, um, you know, they would also violate that right, too. And they'd just <laughs> kill you. And then they would justify, oh, well, so, you know, it's, it's, such a, it's such a mess, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Um, anyway, so then I started asking, you know, okay, well, what are your, you know, what are your names? None of them would tell them, none of them would say their names. Wouldn't give a name and badge number. No name, no badge number. That's another, that's another public servant's yes. priority. They have to, they have to declare themselves. They have to, you know, announce themselves. They have to be accountable to their, to, we're their boss, man. We're their employer. We're their, we're their lord. <laughs> And they've got to be accountable to that. You know, just imagine if uh, you're Donald Trump and, you know, some guy, you know, some guy walks in and Donald Trump's like, I've never seen you before. You know, who are you? And he was like, shut up, Donald. Yeah. You know, that guy would never, ever be in there again. It doesn't matter whether he worked for him or not. He'd be fired. Mm -hmm. He would never talk to Donald that way. Um, but that's actually the way it's supposed to be with the government officials. You know, there are servants, public servants. And that's, that's just a fact in law. So, uh... You know, they wouldn't identify themselves. They wouldn't say what their official capacities were. They didn't even seem to know what that was. Um, they didn't recite their oaths of office. They didn't show an oath of office. And, uh, you know, so that obviously wasn't going anywhere. And then I started, you know, talking to, you know, my fellow, my fellow people. I started telling them about due process of law, proper warrants, um, you know, things like that. So... You know, because I didn't know what was going to happen. All I knew is that they're obviously not following due process of law, so we need to be really, we need to do a recap here of what that is and hold them accountable to that. And then they, you know, this one guy looked at this other guy and nodded, and they grabbed me and escorted me out of the room because they didn't want me telling the truth yeah. about the law. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then they sat me down um, with, um, with my own private guard, uh, fully battle armed SWAT guy, you know, helmet, mask, everything. And, uh, you know, it's so funny because, like, they actually, they actually think that they're being courteous. 
you know, and the way that they're treating us. And, uh, you know, that's just what's really, really sad about it. Um, so anyways, they, uh, they hold us in handcuffs for two hours without ever seeing a warrant. Um, then they wind up arresting me, um, kidnapping me. Uh, for supposedly some outstanding traffic tickets, of which they supposedly have warrants for, but they didn't show me those either. Uh, you know, so they took me away, uh, and, you know, the rest, you know, I all know from everyone else's sworn, sworn and attested to affidavits, but uh, they were here for 10 hours. The SWAT team left a little, a little after, a little after, I, uh, well, basically around the same time, um, I was I was taken away. The SWAT team, the SWAT team left, uh, and which is really interesting because we all know for a fact that the SWAT team was was here with their battle regalia for two hours, and they're telling the media that it was only for forty five minutes, which is really not a big issue because it doesn't actually matter. But it just shows that they're li they're lying, they're lying and lying and lying and lying and lying and lying, and they're trying to say that we're lying. They're trying to discredit us. And see, here's the thing, is that they didn't let us use video cameras, they didn't let us use a cell phone, they didn't even let us use anything to document or, you know, anything like that. Um, you know, so everyone was in handcuffs for at least two hours. Finally, they did unhandcuff uh, because, you know, we were compliant and, you know, not fighting and risking, you know, being belligerent and whatnot. And... Then, you know, there was a lot of other, you know, armed, normal police officers, um, you know, still on site. Um, everyone was always guarded, you know, with, uh, you know, with pe by people with guns at all times. Um, they had a huge, you know, uh, you know, crew of, of code compliance. Um, oh, and, you know, a nook and the babies. Um, after I came down, the four, they escorted me out when I started talking about the truth, they brought a nook down in handcuffs, and she wasn't with her with her children. And me and Shelly immediately were like, you know, where where are the babies? And she's like, they're up to her upstairs asleep. And I immediately told the you know the officers in the area, I said, listen, you, you know that one child is two weeks old and has never been away from its mother. You know, it nurses all the time, and you know, so they need to be back with their mother like now. And uh, you know, so again, they think they're being generous and, and courteous. Um, they had her in handcuffs for about 20 minutes. And they brought her back upstairs, left her in handcuffs, put her in the rocking chair. And then the two-week-year-old started to wake up. And, you know, Anouk, you know, had her handcuffs, you know, behind her back and said, you know, I need to nurse my baby. You know, but she's being guarded with a gun. So, you know, she has to ask to nurse her own child. And then, you know, the officer, you know, you know, calls down, you know, permission for a mother to, you know, nurse, you know, infant or whatever, and then, you know, it comes back affirmative or whatever, so they take off her handcuffs and they, you know, say, stay in bed and don't move. And then, so they guard her with guns of two to four people at all times. For I don't know how she feels about it, but a lot of women consider that a rather private moment, too. Yeah, I mean, she's naked. She's got her breasts exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, the children are naked. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and it's one thing if your family, you know, sees you naked or your close friends, but people in masks with yeah. guns. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not okay. You know, it's not okay. And, uh, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't beat or rape the children, you know, and they didn't keep her from nursing her children. So, you know, in that sense, it's fine. But, you know, the whole thing is that every single step of the way was all in violation of due process of law. So... You know, just because they didn't kill somebody doesn't mean that, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. Right. And so, you know, finally, uh, so she spends, you know, a couple hours, you know, sort of, you know, nursing her children and sort of, you know, dozing and whatnot. Um, you know, for most of the day, we're not, no one's allowed to go outside, but finally, you know, through persistence and insistence, they allow people to go and let the chickens out and feed the chickens and water the chickens and water the crops because, you know, everything will die if we don't. Um, but that's all under armed guard. Uh, they don't let us go anywhere near any of the, you know, code compliance crew, which is out there destroying our land and stealing stuff from our land. They took over 2,000, or, or, I don't know, there's an official report. It's over 4,000 pounds of, of, 
of materials, which for us were all valuable, usable materials. They, they may see them as code violations, but for us it's our livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, so they Your property. Yeah, our property. <laughs> right. We don't care if you like it or not. We don't care if you think it's ugly or not. It's our property. You know, this is a hate crime. This mm -hmm. is a hate crime because, okay, let's say you're, you know, walking down the street and you see some, you know, some person with, you know, a wart on their face and bald spot on their head, you know, and they, they kind of stink. Yeah. You know, you don't go, you're fucking ugly. I don't like you. Get on the ground now. I'm putting handcuffs on you and I'm taking everything you have. That would be considered a hate crime. And everyone would think, obviously, that's not okay. Or, you know, you're this religion or, you know, you're a Jew, so we're going to kill you. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, that's a hate crime. But this is a hate crime, too, because all we're doing is pursuing our right to happiness, our spiritual path, you know, providing our livelihood for our own, our own family, our friends, the people that we love. We're not doing anything to, you know, to hinder on other people's right to live. You are living just like my parents lived 40 years ago, yeah. a mile away from here. We had compost piles. We had crops. We had junk all over the yard. You know, nobody in that neighborhood pa had paved driveways or parking places. You, right. you had a place where there's no grass because you parked there all the time. Right. Well, when you're when you're in places that everyone's doing it, it's not a big deal. I mean, we are in Arlington. Yeah. We're on the outskirts of Arlington. Right across the street is a junkyard. Yeah. I'm sure when you go to town, it's to Kennedale, not Arlington. Yeah, ideally. That was the way it was for us. You know, even, even in Arlington city limits, Kennedale was closer than downtown Arlington. Yeah. So, uh... You know, I mean, I, I understand that they have codes and statutes and all sorts of stuff that exists, uh, but there is no statute or code or law that can supersede the supreme law, and the supreme law dictates that we have in a certain inalienable rights, and they're trying to enforce statutes and codes that limit and or hinder or invalidate those inalienable rights, and therefore it's void ab initio. That's our whole point, and we can prove that according to law. We already have proved it on record, and they've already agreed to it. They already acquiesced to it, and we have proof of that. So, anyways, they spent 10 hours here. Uh, they cut down and destroyed uh, mass amounts of Johnson grass, um, which has already been sanctioned um, as a, you know, as a legitimate, uh, you know, crop, yeah. a legitimate, uh, sustainable, you know, resource material, which was for us in many ways. We used it, you know, as bedding for animals, as food for animals. We used it in, you know, earthen building practices. Um, we used it as a shade crop. Uh, we have all sorts of things that we're able to grow, even in the heat at the middle of the summer, that our neighbors can't grow because it's just too hot. Their tomato plants die, so they've got to have a spring crop and a fall crop. Our tomatoes produce all year because we've got shade crops, and Johnson, Johnson grass is one of our shade crops. Um, you know, we juice That's it. Interesting. Yeah, we juice it. It's got a, you know a lot of uh, you know a lot of a lot of great nutrition. Uh, Johnson grass. Yeah, in the I juice. Know that. Yeah. Uh, I know all about it for hay, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, you know, if you're not used to it, it doesn't necessarily taste good, but uh, it's <laughs> highly nutritious. It's a little hard to juice because it's so fibrous, but it is juiceable, and we have we do juice it. Uh, so they cut down tons of Johnson grass, um, but they also cut down uh, okra. They cut down blackberry bushes. They cut down sweet potatoes, sweet potato vines. They cut down uh, tomatillo plants. Uh, they cut down our sunflowers, which were also shade crops, mm -hmm. which were also, you know, you know, gifts that we gave to people, also one of our trade commodities. Right. Uh, and they were food for our bees, which are an essential part of our ecosystem. Uh, you know, we've, and that's the thing. We had, we, all, we we, had right, all of this. We had a, bees. Yeah. We've got a full ecosystem here. You know, we're doing this all deliberately. We're not just lazy hippies. Right? We're not even hippies at all. We're extremely educated, extremely intelligent, deliberately tell. attending to a, a responsible life, mm -hmm. a very responsible life. We're independent. We're, you know, we don't, you know, we don't ask, you know, for, you know, we don't ask to be taken care of. You know, we're taking care of ourselves. And, uh, you know, with great freedom, or with, great res well, with great power comes, you know, great responsibility. But you cannot have freedom without responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're living very free, but because we're living truly responsible, it's the only way it can work. So they were here for 10 hours. They destroyed all of all that stuff. They took all that stuff. And then they just left, you know, at, you know, at five, oh, end of the work day, you know, we're done. Uh, you know, just, you know, took off like, it, you know, no big deal, you know, just another job. And here's what's really crazy, man, is that throughout the day, the, 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 the free men and women that were here, they were going around asking people that they could 
come in contact with, you know, of course we weren't allowed to go wherever we wanted to, but when we were able to go somewhere in contact with some government, you know, servant, you know, we'd ask, you know, what is your name? You know, do you have an oath of office? What's your, you know, official capacity? You know, none of them would, almost, not, not every single one, but almost none of them would answer any of those questions. A lot of them actually covered their badges, covered their name tags. They even would cover, like, cover their faces like this. I mean, that's just, not only is it not okay when you're a government official to do that, um, you know, it's in violation of, of, their, of their duties, which is not okay, but it's also just dishonorable and disrespectful, and it also, yes. it, you know, this could be conjecture, but, um, you know, I'm not under penalty of perjury right now, so it's not a big deal, but it shows dishonesty, you know? You've got something to hide. <laughs> You've got something to hide. And, you know, it just proves how dishonest they were. And we actually asked multiple individuals, you know, like, why are you doing this? So it's my job. <laughs> you know, I've got to put food on the table. So, you know, okay, so you don't ask, you don't ask any questions whatsoever. Um, you're willing to put guns to people's head and take their food just so you can put food on your table. Okay, that's not a job. That's, uh, you know, being a pirate. Yeah. You know, that's being an organized criminal. <laughs> You know, that's what that is. That isn't even what they wanted to do when they were growing up. No. They wanted to help people when they were growing up. Of course they did. It's everyone is, get corrupted is, in the wrong way. Almost everybody is born good. Uh -huh. You know, and ultimately we all want to do good. And it's just, it's really sad what people are perverted and, you know, manipulated and, you know, yeah. you know just conditioned into over time. You know, the, the, one, the officer that drove me, um, you know, to the jail, um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, comply with anything, and so he was trying to get me to go in jail, and I, you know, said, no, I want to be with my children, you know. He said, I want to be home with my children, too. And I said, yeah, but you weren't taken from your children at gunpoint. You left your children. You left your children just like you do every day. I purposefully am here every single day with my children because I have real priorities. See, if you want to be with your children, you can. You can. And if you make it a priority, it will happen. If you're not with your children, it's because you haven't made it a true priority. You can blame anything you want, but you got to be responsible. You know, we don't make a lot of money here. We make a lot less money than most people live off of. We, you know, if if you talk about income, you know, we would be in the poverty, you know, poverty status. Um, but we don't live like poverty status. We live like kings and queens. And what that shows is, is that. It's just an excuse. It's just an excuse to say, oh, well, I don't have money, so I can't be with my children. Or, oh, I can't be with my children because I have to have a job. There are so many ways to put food on the table. And we're showing one of those very easy, I mean, there is work involved. You know, it's oh, not yeah. easy in the <laughs> sense that. Anyone that's done any kind of farming knows that it's not just go out and pick the food and, right. and cook it. There's a lot more to it than right. that. But we have integrated and implemented all sorts of systems that doesn't really exist in farming, per se, that make it way easier and way more yeah. productive. And one of, one of those uh, things we're really getting into now is uh, aquaponic systems. Mm -hmm. Now with aquaponic systems, you can very easily produce 10 times the amount of food that you could on a farm with the same amount of space. And for the most part, uh, you, know, you can have it just on automatic. You can have mm -hmm. it all set on a timer. You, know, you can have pumps do it all. And with an aquaponic system, you know, really all you, all you have to do is plant the crop and then harvest the crop. And you can even do it all year long because you can build a greenhouse with aquaponic right. system because it takes so much less space. That probably made them suspicious too, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> they did. But again, it doesn't matter what makes them suspicious. What matters is the law. Oh, yeah. And so, again, here's the thing is that they had a warrant, right, for drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. They said that, uh, and, and it was based on an affidavit that was all conjecture. There was no facts in there whatsoever. All conjecture. And that's what they based their warrant on. And then the judge said that gives us probable cause to, you know, to search and seize, you know, anything related to, um, you know, mar the marijuana plants and different stages of growth, uh, you know, harvested and, you know, prepared and, you know, you know, marijuana for distribution, you know, high intensity grow lights and fertilizers and, you know, I mean, just tons of things listing all the stuff that would be involved in a, you know, a high level, you know, operation, you know, logs and data and stacks of cash and, yeah. you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and on the back of the warrant, um, 
you know, it's it, you know, it was written out in a hand. Item seized, none, <laughs> signed. <laughs> so they didn't find anything. They didn't even go after your fertilizer and we whether they had grow lights. We don't have fertilizer. I bet you do. It just doesn't come in bags marked 12, 12, 12. Yeah. Well, it's compost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's not fertilizer. It's compost. Um, you know, so, yeah, we, they, we didn't have anything, nothing that they were looking for that they had, which proves that um, not only did they not follow due process of law, but they're pretty inept, you know, to spend 50000 dollars and, you know, come out with a result like this. I mean, that's just horrible police work, you know. I'm not even trained in police work. I could do way better than that. You know, no problem whatsoever. Like, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's very sad that, you know, things like this go on and that, you know, it's one thing to make a mistake and be like, yeah, I made a mistake mm -hmm. and this is what I'm going to do to make it better. But it's another thing to make a mistake and then be like, oh, I didn't make a mistake. Right. No, no, I didn't make a mistake. You Can know, that's that just so double the police. In Austin, we're dealing with it with, you know, black guys shot in the back of the head that were unarmed. And, oh, oh we didn't make a mistake. Yeah. I mean, that's double dishonor. Yeah. And, you know, something has to be done. And so here's the thing is that only we, the people, have the power. Um, only we can enforce the law. And like I said, uh, you're not free unless you defend your own freedom, unless you enforce your own freedom. And so we, the people, we have the power, but all the problems are our problem. Because if we have the power... That means that we've given the power away, and this is what's happened. So we have to take responsibility for that. We got to stop complaining. We got to stop complaining about how shitty it is and how we don't like it, and we have to do something. And if we do do something, it will change, because again, like I said, we're paying, we're 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 supporting everything, um, you know. And even the law enforcement individuals, they're still people, you know. It's not like I mean, they're obviously highly manipulated and trained and conditioned, but they're still people, right? You know, and you know, organizations like Oath Keepers, you know, is really powerful. You know, we need to be, you know, that everybody needs to be aware of that because that's, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, you know, we need to implement new standards and training practices in the law enforcement, you know, areas. And we, the people, have the power to enforce all of that. You know, we can make the decisions. So this whole thing that happened, you know, it's a travesty, it's an atrocity, it's a violation of all of our rights, a due process of law, a total mistake. Um, and we've had a lot of hardship from it, like I said, because not only did we lose all those crops and all those materials, but we've been locked down for six months. You know, we, our patrons can't come. We can't do all the things that uh, support our livelihood. Um, you know, so it's been really hard, but we're really inspired. You know, we're really motivated to, you know, to share this information, uh, to make this a point, uh, you know, to, to let people know, like, not only are we going to see justice, you know, we're going to see justice here. And ideally, that inspires people. You know, ideally, people have a glimmer of hope that it is possible to be free, and mm -hmm. it is possible to enforce justice. Uh, and you know, maybe that'll be something that catches on. Because it's, I decided it's starting to. <laughs> yeah, I decided a long time ago. You know, basically, give me freedom or give me death. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna live as a slave. I'm not gonna live complacent, compliant. Uh, I'm not gonna live as a subject. You know, I won't do it. So, I will live free, uh, and hopefully that can be here because you know I love this country. You know this is my land, but you know maybe I'll go somewhere else. Uh, you know, or you know maybe someone will kill me. I don't know. I really appreciate this interview. <laughs> Needless to say, I agree wholeheartedly with a lot of it, yeah. with just about everything. Well, you know, it's an unfortunate situation, but it's also a very fortunate situation because now. You know, we've got people like you that are showing up, mm -hmm. right? We're meeting some really great and powerful individuals. You know, the people are showing up that are already, you know, doing stuff like this. There's not that yeah. many of them. Yeah. But the ones that are, you know, they're all connected. They're all tuned in. They're all networked because those of us who do know, we know how important it is and we're dedicating our lives to it. Mm -hmm. And so the more of us that tap in, the stronger our web of power is. Right. And all of a sudden... I have close friends that I have a feeling when they see this are going to be in touch with you because they're setting up their family farm to be completely sustainable. Good, good. I mean, I, I live the life of a software engineer. I do go to work and deal with all that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing wrong with it if that's what you truly want to do. Yeah. But it is also possible to do that from your own home. If you can do it from your own home, you can do it from India and be the richest man in your village on $10 an hour. 
So, you know, to go for the money, you have to cooperate with the team and be there and have the answers and all that, and not just be the lone hacker. Well, again, you have to have your priorities. Work. You know, and there's nothing, I don't believe that money's bad. You know, and people that want it, that's fine. Uh, I think that most people that want money, they have misguided desires and perceptions within their own head. I think that they think that money is going to give them things that they want that's going to make them happy, but really it doesn't. And there's a void inside that never really gets filled, and people just get older and older and older. Uh, you know, but again, that's not for me to decide. You yeah. know, it's for you to live and for you to learn and, you know, for you to decide and choose whatever you do with your own life. Yeah. And, you know, we're not here to change people, but a lot of people have changed their lives because of what we're doing. Because they see what we're doing and they're like, holy shit, like people now are writing us, holy crap, we had no idea anything like this existed in Arlington. <laughs> Arlington's like the worst city on the earth. Are you serious? Yeah. You're doing this in Arlington? And yet you this know. was normal in this area 40 years ago. Oh, yeah. Totally. Do you know history of Eden Road and the neighborhood and things like that? Not really, no. It's really just named after the Eden family farm. Oh. And I should find it on the internet. Uh, it's like Ancestry.com has a 1880s map of southeast Tarrant County that shows all the farms and who owned them. And it's like all of these roads with hyphenated names, the Russell Curry, Eden Curry, Hawkins Calendar, Kennedale Sublet, everything else. Well, Kennedale Sublet was the sublet that went to Kennedale. Uh, Kelly Elliott, it was named because the road went from one farm to another farm. Right, and see. Arlington's changed the names of a lot of it you know, since I was a kid. Right. But Destroy the heritage. Yeah, you could literally overlay it onto Google Maps and look at the street names and realize that, yeah, each, each of these street names, it's you know, hyphenated names. That's it went cool. from Kelly's farm to Elliott's farm. It went from Hawkins' farm to Calendar's farm. Yeah, well, history is really powerful and it's really important. And, you know, it really just blows my mind because I've, I've done my own history. You know, I don't get my history from school because that history is just, you know, mm -hmm. control. But if you really do real research on history, you know, it's very easy to see that for thousands of years um, there have been free market economies, um, you know, that grow and thrive because free market economies always grow and thrive. And then at some point in time, you know, at some point in time, the government begins to, you know, tax and license and regulate and control and more and more and more and more, and more and more. And then the whole thing collapses, you know, a huge depression, you know, millions of people die, you know, civil war, you know, blah, 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 you know, genocides, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, perhaps a rebuild and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you can also find a lot of history that shows that, uh, you know, say, for example, in the United States of America, you know, we have the Constitution. It doesn't give us rights. You know, right. It upholds our rights that we already have. These, these rights are inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just there to serve and protect, to uphold the rights that we already have. And the reason why they're there is to try, it, they were there to try to keep what's happening now from ever happening because the people that did that, they knew because they knew their history. They'd, they've seen that this same thing keeps <laughs> happening, blah, 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 blah. So they tried to create a more perfect union. They tried to create something that would, would keep this from happening. And what happens is that the bankers, man, they just come in and they take over control of the, of the monetary system of, of the country. And then, you know, basically they collapse the whole thing. They, 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 leech, they leech the real value, you know, the water rights and the land rights and everything over time. And then completely debase the value of the of the currency, which becomes a fiat currency, mm -hmm. and then the people lose everything. Yeah. Despite this, despite your rights. Yep. So. Well, that's like the idea: you have the right to defend your property, but they'll kill you if you use it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, man. So uh, we're you know we're excited about the people that we're meeting and. Uh, the potential for you know freedom and justice and inspiration that this whole thing is providing, and the more the more you can share, you know the better. We're grateful for any people we get to meet that can really help support this. You know, it's it's not just about us; it's about us. Oh yeah. You know, like we as a people, and uh, you know we're doing it for us just as much as we're doing it for us. Well, that police accountability summit that we're having Saturday—it's short notice to invite you, but. Mm -hmm. If you can get to Austin, you'd be incredibly welcome there. I'm hoping to show, I don't know if I can show the whole thing. We're already yeah. at 49 minutes. You probably can't. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it, you know, mm -hmm. wedge it into a schedule that's already set. Uh -huh. If not, you know, it's going to be on our websites, on our YouTube channels, 
things like that. Great. Well, you know, it's a possibility. Um, you know, obviously we're really busy, but, uh, you know, if something's really important. Um, we do plan on going to Austin sometime relatively soon because we want to connect with some groups and some people down in that area and share some of the, you know, share some of the information about what we know and about what's going on here and, you know, why, why it's so important and, you know, things like that and, you know, do some networking and, and all that. So we definitely have we definitely would like to be down in Austin sometime soon. Okay. Saturday, you're talking about next, like this Saturday. Like yeah, two days. day after tomorrow. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with Radley Balco's work? He's you know, just released a book on the militarization on, of police, and he's very big on the abuses of SWAT raids. He's going to be one of our speakers. Good. We're having Bobby Seal, who founded the Black Panthers, and also kind of invented cop watching, and he's... You know, back when they did it in the 60s, they went around with the old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and shotguns. And he says now a camcorder is a better weapon against the police than a shotgun. <laughs> right. Yeah, a shotgun just gets you killed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a real travesty, too, that's happening now, which is that, uh, you know, there's actually a lot of you know, militarized police, of course, that are you know trying to keep people from filming. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I'm wondering if they shut down... It's hard to say a three-block radius in this area, but SWAT team does anything, even when you know, even when they're doing it right, you know, keep someone from killing himself or hostages or something like that. It's like they shut down a three-block radius, and sure, yes, a bullet can go that far. The farther out, the less the odds are that that stray bullet's going to hit you. But yeah, yeah they had like they that. had the perimeter totally secure. They had all of our yeah. neighbors, you know, had police cars in the neighbors. You know, place they have yeah, the roads all blocked do. off. Um, you know, and they made very, very sure that we didn't couldn't have any cameras going because you know it would have mm -hmm. been so great if we had you know video surveillance on the yeah. on the land because we would have been able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that they were over here for over two hours and we were in handcuffs for over two hours and it would just prove again their blatant lies. Yeah, twenty twenty hindsight cameras would have really been good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we we thought about it beforehand too. We mm -hmm. just, you know, it's expensive to set yeah. up, and it requires <laughs> a lot of energy and you know maintenance to upkeep. Um, well, know. my advice is cheap cameras. Walmart has a little flip camera for about twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have your own SD card and batteries. But if nothing else, when you see the SWAT team in your driveway like you did, you turn it on and set it in an inconspicuous spot on a shelf. It's not like having the whole house wired with cameras and you know, ultraviolet sensors and motion sensors and everything else, but it's $20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Cell phones are good, but they know about cell phones, and yeah, they won't let you use them if they can stop you. I mean, cell phone on a shelf before you answer the door is at least a step in the right direction. Yeah, well, there's no answer in the door on this one. Uh, you know, they, uh, they didn't announce themselves. They didn't ask to come in. They didn't say, hey, we're here to see so-and-so. You know, they came in guns blazing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and as soon as they saw somebody, you know, you were down on the ground. Yeah. Okay, can you show me a little bit outside? Yeah, well, that's another thing. <laughs> Growing up here, people sold quilts, <laughs> whatever they could make all the time. Eggs and milk. If you know where that uh, Displaced Carmelite Monastery on Sublet is, that used to be a dairy. My parents bought raw milk there. Oh, yeah? Yep. Yeah, raw milk is the best, man. Yeah. So much better, and that's, that's <laughs> another real big... <laughs> you know, issue I have is that they're, you know, arresting people for selling raw milk. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's just, it's not okay. So, I guess, I don't know, are you wanting to see, like, the garden? Whatever you'd like to show me. Whatever you think's worth seeing, we'll see it. Yeah, this rocket stove's real cool. 
Uh, oh, is that your badly stacked firewood? Oh, uh, we've got a <laughs> lot. Yeah, that, we've got a lot of badly stacked firewood. Good grief. They don't like. <laughs> I didn't even know that was part of the code. Oh, she's asleep? Outside with us, then. I'm pointing the camera the other direction. Would you like to say hi? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that rocket stove is a real cool little piece of technology. I don't know if you've ever heard of rocket stoves, but uh, it's uh, real simple. I just, use, <laughs> yeah. I just use bricks and cob. Hadn't heard it called that, but yeah, we learned a trick like that in Boy Scouts. Yeah, and uh, you know the whole mechanics behind it is that you uh, you have the burn chamber back here. Uh -huh. And it's a super, in, uh, it's a super insulated riser or AKA chimney, and so not, you get a super, you get a super draft, you know, so uh -huh. it pulls the air in really hard from that side, and because it's super insulated, the uh, the the flame gets way hotter and therefore combusts a lot more percentage of the fuel. So, if you ever have a fire, and let's say like there's black stuff on the bottom of a pot, right, it's because the fuels aren't fully combusted. There's mm -hmm. all sorts of fuel that's still being uncombusted, and that's because it's not hot enough uh, to combust. So this gets the fire much hotter, which gets a much more full combustion, which means you get way more fire with way less wood. Yeah. We even learned to do that digging a hole in the ground like a U-shaped tunnel yeah, in the ground. exactly. There's so many ways you can do it. You have a squirrel mad at us somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got all these... Uh, you know, uh, electrical wheel. Yeah, that's a you know, pathways. Uh -huh. How's the copperhead population? It's, uh, you know, if, if there's a lot of copperheads, we don't know about it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, there used to be more, I promise you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure that there did. You know, and we may have some some, you know, but uh, we see some pretty big snakes from time to time, but it seem Oh, to be... you have poke. I love poke. <laughs> what? Poke, the plants with the berries there. Oh. That is my favorite vegetable in the entire world. Really? That's a edible vegetable? Oh, yeah. Pick those leaves and boil them and change the water several times. They're a good laxative if you don't. But yes, pick those and put some apple cider vinegar on them. That is my favorite vegetable in the entire world. Really? Yep. So you pick those leaves and you boil them really uh -huh. hard, I guess? Yeah, change and the change water. the water a, a few times. Huh. It is delicious. Interesting. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of little basil plants and aloe and... Yeah. All, you can, do is, all you can do is protect it. It has to be planted. Seeds have to go through a bird to plant. <laughs> so when it comes up like that, protect it. Now you can pick the whole plant as long as the roots are okay. Got a well shower right there. Yeah. The water comes out uh, nice and cold, 55 degrees or so. <laughs> so it's pretty much impossible to get hot here in the summer, actually. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, if you get hot, you just, it's easy to cool down, is my point. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another possibility for the raids is ragweed. Yeah. If you look at it from a distance, not here we can see how the leaves are, but look at a ragweed plant from a distance. Right. It's shaped like a marijuana plant. Right. That's why all the jokes about you know, Mexican ditchweed being ragweed. Do you know what that is? <laughs> yeah, that's a ragweed. That's a It'll weed. give you allergies. Yeah. I don't. I don't advise cultivating it. But yeah, you got more poke there. Poke Settler. Weed. Uh huh. Settlers used that, right? to use the purple berries for ink. Mm -hmm. I think you can eat it if you cook it. You have to boil it, pour the water out, boil, boil it, again, pour the water out, out, and then put some cider vinegar on it, and it's my favorite vegetable in the for world. Real? Yes, it is delicious. You want me to hold that baby? Uh huh. Hmm? So yeah, these are both pecan trees right here. Yeah. Um, Got uh, quite a quite a, a few different uh, garden plots. Yeah. Uh, they did quite a bit of destruction of our shade crops in here. So like we, you know, it doesn't look good, but we're trying to save our plants from dying, but they're dying anyways uh, because they cut our sunflowers and Johnson grass over here. So the heat looks is, like they trampled through the middle of that one. Well, the it's the the sun. Uh, oh, okay. They cut our shade crop 
crops and the sun just got too hot and it started killing killing our uh, our tomatoes there so those are now dying uh, but we've got I don't know if you want to walk through there or not love to this was actually the uh, this was actually the alleged marijuana patch in here oh okay and when they got here they were like oh these are just tomato plants yep so yeah these are all tomato plants here and basil <laughs> yep, tons of basil. We've got oh, uh, purple basil, uh, you know, Italian basil. We've got uh, Thai basil. We've got uh, lemon basil, lime basil, sweet basil. Basil, we got tons <laughs> of it. It grows really well. We got peppers, peppers all up in here. Uh, Is that a peach tree in the corner? Yep, that's a peach tree. Yep. It's got some peaches on it. It's only a three year old peach tree. Wow. Yeah, it's grown super fast. Got a nice mm -hmm. cucumber right here. Yep. Cayenne peppers. Yep, cayenne peppers, one of my favorite crops. Yep. We've got tons of grasshoppers, <laughs> which um, most people see as a pest, but I actually see them as a food myself. Oh, okay. This is a different blackberry than we had, and yeah, it has nice five finger leaves too. Yeah, or is this? Blackberry bushes. We've got blackberries that uh, border the whole the whole garden plot. Yeah. They didn't cut down the ones on this side, thankfully. Okay. But they cut down the ones on the other side. They may come back. Yeah. They may. <laughs> My parents grew the blackberries right over the septic tank lines. They did beautifully. <laughs> hey, you want me to hold you? Right. No. Okay. Try not to see Kiki on the video. Yeah. I am trying not to. Uh, these are all uh, t big, huge, uh, you know, super tire raised beds. Mm -hmm. uh, those were some of the first, the first uh, things we grew, grew in because at the, when we when we were first here, I mean, this was like some of the worst soil you can possibly find, um, and so, you know, we made compost and filled these tires. Nice. And uh, we've been growing in them really successfully for many years now. Um, so we grow all sorts of greens and stuff like that in there. Uh, is that spinach right there? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, a lot of the crops in the raised beds are, are dead now in the middle of the summer peak. Uh, but we'll replant them here in a couple weeks probably. Well, these are the kind of a native sunflower, aren't they? Now that I think about it, I, yeah, I remember these. Yeah, they're a native sunflower. Uh huh. I remember them. <laughs> And then i uh, got a couple more plots over here. Uh, this is a uh, herb, an herb plot. we got sage and rosemary and thyme and oregano and lavender, uh, dill, rosemary. Yeah. Uh, we got some <laughs> uh, arugula down there at the end. Hmm. Some other lettuce greens right there. Uh, we got a bunch of melons. Yep. Cantaloupes. Chain in there, yep. <laughs> uh, a bunch more basils. Is this a broccoli or? A bunch of okra. It was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's way too hot for it now. Yeah. Yeah, most of all, most of all the stuff in here is now gone. You know, that's just part of, you know, you know, we don't, <laughs> uh, you know, we're not like, you know, mechanical in our farming. You know, obviously it's not the neatest, you know, or maybe the most pretty. Uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> you know, but it works, and we really use a very small amount of time for the yields that we get. I'm going to take pictures of your asparagus leaves on that plant. Yeah, go for it. Because, because of my theory. You mean okra? Or, yeah, not. Yeah, look at that huge asparagus. okra. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Actually, I hate okra, but. <laughs> I'll eat it when my dad cooks it into gumbo, because he cooks it down where you can't even find it. Uh -huh. And it's funny because my son and my stepson hate onions and they'll eat the onions in my gumbo. All right. But yeah. Got a bunch of gourds that, right here. Yep. That shape is why definitely in the 1970s they pulled up a guy's okra crop on Sublet Road, not too far from here. Yeah, our okra plants are real small this year. We got a, a late and slow start on them, but you know normally they're like yeah. you know up this tall by now. And uh, 
that's a statue that was donated to us. Um, you know, we're not religious, but uh, it's beautiful and peaceful. Yeah. Well. And uh, I'm probably not very, not the most dedicated practitioner, but I'm as Buddhist as I am anything. Yeah, Buddhism is a very peaceful and you know Zen Zen yeah. perspective, which you know we really respect and appreciate. Um, this doesn't look like much out here. It looks mostly like tall grasses, but it's Johnson actually a sweet, a sweet potato crop. Oh, okay. And Johnson grass for shade? Yeah. That makes sense. So we got, we'll have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of sweet potatoes in there when we yeah. dig them up in the fall. Yeah. I've, I've raised them, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the main places where they cut down stuff was you know, right over here. Okay. And then over on this other side, on the far side here. Well, hello, kitty cat. We even had a white cat. Yeah. <laughs> She's a real cat right there, man. She, uh... Keeps the mouse population down. Yeah, she's a hunter, man. She'll, uh... These are some really cool uh, little tiny grow box greenhouses we made. Yeah. We just got, got this curved uh, glass and some glass doors, and then we just buried them in wood chips to help mm -hmm. insulate them. They work extremely well for plant starts and, yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, and the blackberries have the five finger leaves. I'm really wondering if they were that ignorant. Well, obviously, it's hard to believe they would be, but it fits too well. Well, you would think with their training and the mass amount of money that they use. Yeah. But yeah, this was all, uh, this all was clear cut right here. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there was Johnson grass here, there was sunflowers, there was blackberry bushes, uh, there was uh, okra plants, and tomatillos yeah and they just you know cut it all down you know with the grass there's a wild tomatillo that's native to this area a little english pea sized thing but you see it grow in the little magic lantern kind of shell and taste it it's a tomatillo mm -hmm. it's just not really big enough to you'd have to shell a whole bunch of them to make a cup of sauce right and then uh, right over here you know we've got uh more herbs uh, mostly herbs. Uh, we've got tons of herbs. I mean, obviously, way more than we can possibly possibly use. But you know, it's one of our trade crops. Yeah. Um, you know, which we're not really able to trade at all now because they've tried to completely shut us down. Uh, we traded stuff back and forth all the time. I know. Well, it's it's one, it's the best form of of, of exchange there is. Yes. Uh, We've got bamboo that we planted. Yeah, the lab will have realized that that's technically a grass and say so you have tall grass. Yeah. Well, again, like I said, the whole point of what we're doing is to establish that they don't have actually any authority or jurisdiction to tell us what we can and cannot yeah. grow. You know, it's, it's our land. Actually, a lot of the reason why we planted it was for them because, um, you know, we were trying to, you know, create the unsightly ugliness of our land, uh, you know, hide it away from the, the road mm -hmm. so people didn't have to see it. <laughs> I don't think it's unsightly at all. I don't think it is either. <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's beautiful. You know, it's not, you know, it's not prim and pretty. It's not manicured. But, uh, you know, what's really beautiful about it is it's totally sustainable. We don't use any fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides. It's all organic materials composted in. You know, we don't use machines. You know, there's, like, there's the saying that 40 years ago they didn't call it organic food, they just called right, it food. called it food, exactly. That's all there was. Yep. Uh, and that is a huge apple tree. Do you ever get apples off of it? It's not an apple tree. It's not? No, it's oh. an elm tree, I think. Oh, okay. It looked like apple. Or maybe just a, like some sort of a young tree. And, and it's definitely not an apple tree. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty positive. Got these little tiny. That's the biggest. No, these might be apples that just don't take off. Really? Yeah, I think so. Because apple trees do well in Texas, but they require lots of water and lots of care to put on little bitty, not so good apples. Really? They're a fantastic shade so tree. So if we what? If we watered them way more or what? 
Maybe, I, have, I won't claim to be a, an expert on that. I've never gotten it to work. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's a shade tree. And if it dies or you trim it back or anything, if you smoke meat, it's a fantastic smoking wood. Nice. But yeah, yeah, sitting under here, you realize why it's a popular shade tree, even if you never get an apple off of it. Now, pear pears will do well around here. We had a pear tree yeah, these that... look almost more like pears than apples. Nah, if they were pears, they'd take off. But yeah, I'm just about positive that's what these are, is failed apples. Interesting. The Mustang grapes that grow native around here, they'll actually tear your mouth up if you eat too many of them fresh, but yeah. they make the best grape jelly in the world. Nice. Yeah, you know, it's amazing with how much you know, there's always so much you don't know. Uh-huh. And, uh... You know, we don't claim to know everything, and that's a really part, important part about, again, due process of law and what we, you know, what we, in, you know, engaged with in the city is what we were saying is that this is what we know, and if you know something else and can prove it yeah. under due process of law, you know, under penalty of perjury, we're happy to hear that, but, you know, otherwise, then it must be true. Uh -huh. So we're happy to, you know, receive any new information about anything, <laughs> you know. Well, you may enjoy, there's a site, I think it's historicarials.com. Historic Aerials, like it's all one word. I hope that's right. Maybe a Google search will get it if it's not. Mm -hmm. That, you know, has pictures of this area from the 60s, at least back to the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're familiar with J.B. Little Elementary School, if you ever heard of the, well, there's the old building that now they call the old building. Uh -huh. I went first and second grade in an even older building. And they have like a 1964 picture of the old, old building. The building before that was a log cabin that J.B. Little built. Yeah, have you ever heard of uh, pallet buildings? Only that they exist. Yeah, I assume it's just breaking down pallets and using the wood. No, we don't break them down. We just oh. use them as they are. It's extraordinary. It's, I think it's you know one of the best ways to build in an urban... Yeah. Or industrial area because you can get hundreds of these pallets for free. Yeah. Um, or at least really cheap. And a lot of them are, you know, solid hard woods. Uh huh. And, uh. Yeah, the ones that are meant to be reusable usually are hardwood. You get the yellow pine and the ones that they ship something on and don't even want the pallet back. Yeah, the little thin, flimsy, crappy ones. Yeah. Yeah, this whole building right I here. I see. Yep. Pallet building. And uh, we started building a, an addition to it, another pallet building. Real fast. Mm hmm Real easy. Works really well. They're really strong. Yeah. You know, and you can insulate them or weatherproof them as much as you want to. Yep. You know, it's just the structural integrity, you know, you use the pallets for. And then you, you know, insulate and or weatherproof them as much as you want to, depending on what the use is for. Yeah. You know, so we mostly use them for storage and chicken coops and things like that. But, you know, you could easily build a house out of pallets really quickly. Insulate yeah. them really easily, weatherproof them very easily. This is an elm, and it's one of the biggest ones I've ever seen. See the little ribs and the leaves are kind of a clue that it's an elm. Yeah, we've got tons of hackberry trees. Yeah. Which are really primo. We've got a bunch of uh, mulberries. Yep. That's what I thought this was from a distance. Yeah. We've got quite a few fig trees. This is the biggest one we have, so none of them are really very big. But we've got a bunch of fig trees. It'll go from there. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's part of living sustainable. Is it's not an instantaneous gratification thing. Right. You know, it takes time. The cattle yours or the neighbors? What, the, ca the cattle? The cattle? Yeah. yeah. that's our neighbors. Okay. They just do it for a tax write-off, though. <laughs> that does make sense. It'll make it agricultural land in a heartbeat. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate because uh, Shelley's known those neighbors for, you know, 15 years. And they've supposedly been good friends. And, um, 
you know, we specifically went to the neighbors and asked them, you know, do you guys have any problems with what you're, what we're doing? Are you making complaints, you know, about what we're doing? You know, have we hurt you in any way? Are we doing anything that, you know, is a problem? And they all said, oh, no, you know, you know, it's a little weird, but, you know, you're living your life and, you know, to each his own. And then um, we actually found out the, the facts and the truth is, is that these people right here, including other neighbors, actually did make complaints. Hmm. And they lied to our faces about it. They were so dishonorable. They, number one, they couldn't come to us and tell us, hey, yeah. you know, we have a problem with this or blah, blah, blah. And then number two, they lied to us uh, um, saying that they didn't have a problem. And then number three, they made complaints about it anyways. I mean, just so dishonorable. It's just really sad that, you know, that people actually do that these days. You yeah. know, so they're to their neighbors. Yeah. You know, like... Well, is there anything else I need to see? No. Um, there's all sorts of amazing, you know, things <laughs> going on here every day, but you know, it's, uh, the most important part is that uh, you know we're doing it, man. Yeah. We're living free. We're living healthy. Yep. You know, we're living sustainable, independent. <laughs> And we'll zoom out. <laughs> we, we have the right to do that. And, yeah, this is. A... You know, we were all we were all born with the right to do that. Yeah. And if we don't defend, if we don't enforce, then we don't have it. This is the way way people lived when you had to be self sufficient because there wasn't any other choice. Yeah, and you know we're doing this. You know, without we didn't grow up this way. You know, like. We didn't, we didn't, we don't know how, we didn't know how to do this, you know, we didn't go to school to do this, like, we've learned all this from trial and error. Yeah. You know, from just getting out there and making it a priority. You mm -hmm. know, you have to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. You can't just be like, oh, well, <laughs> it's too hard, or I can't, I don't know how to do it, or blah, blah, blah. You know, if you want to live sustainable, if you want to live free, it's got to be a priority. And if you got to live in a tent for a year beforehand, then live in a tent for a year. If you got to live in an RV for five years, then do it. Yep. All right. Any other parting words? <sighs> we are the power. <laughs> I agree. <laughs>